and welcome to Out and About Art, your PGTV source for all things art in Polk County. I'm your host, Yasmin Ali. Last month, Black Tower Gardens resident caroliner Geert de Hollander united thousands of musicians across the world with his original composition, A Sacred Suite. The piece was commissioned by the city of Leuven in Belgium to commemorate the dedication of their new peace carillon, which was finally restored after having been destroyed at the beginning of World War I. To spread their message of peace and reconciliation, representatives from Leuven shared the Hollander's musical score across the world for Caroliners to perform in conjunction with their dedication ceremony on November 11, 2018. The carillon is a musical instrument, it's in fact the heaviest musical instrument in the world. It consists of bells, at least 23, and up to 70 or more. Um, and much like a piano, it is touch sensitive, so you play it instead of with your fingers, you play it with your fists. So every key you see here is connected with a wire to the inside of the bell, there's a clapper, and I play gently, I have a piano sound. I play a little louder, and I have a forte sound. So it's very simple, it's a very old instrument, going back 500 plus years, um, with origins in the low countries in, in Europe, and that's what it is, it hardly changed. And there are only 600 instruments worldwide. I started playing the carillon when I was a little kid. My dad is also a caroliner, and I was born and raised in Belgium. So I grew up climbing towers since I was four or five years old. And you have to imagine, um, back there in Europe, there are a lot of 14, 15 century instruments and towers. So as a little kid, you got the places where nobody else comes. And you see bats and owls and secret doors and steps. And you know, it's, it's like giant clockworks. It's like, you know. So I, I grew up, and, and I'm not exaggerating, I felt like Harry Potter. I was so fascinated by the whole thing. And I asked my dad, like, you know, can I do this too? And he said, yeah, sure, I'll take you to the school. And I was lucky because he was a professor at the Royal Carillon School in Belgium. Um, he took me along. I graduated when I was 17. I combined it with middle school. And at that point, he said, I'm going to show you the most beautiful instrument in the world. And he flew me from Brussels straight to Bach Tower Gardens. And that's how I ended up here. There was an old monastery, an abbey, in the city of Leuven in Belgium that was destroyed in World War I. And it had a carillon, a very old carillon, a 16th uh, century instrument. And they recently found out that all the soldiers came from one little city in Germany, Neuss. The city of Leuven in Belgium decided to contact the other city, the German city, and said like, hey, you know, it's been 90 years that our carillon was destroyed, the old historical instrument, what if we built together a new carillon and we call it the peace carillon for this occasion? I thought that was a splendid idea. So they rebuilt the tower years ago and the only thing that was missing was the, their instrument. They got you know, sponsors and donors from all over the world and just realized the, the instrument and the dedication of the instrument is on Veterans Day. Veterans Day in the US is Armistice Day in the rest of the world. So basically the 11th of November is celebrated worldwide. The city of Leuven contacted me through their caroliner. Um, it's a very small world. There are only about 400 people, professionals, playing the instrument. So we all know each other. And I've been, a, I've been composing for this instrument for the last 30 years. Um, and I was very honored. They gave me a call and they said like, hey, this is the project we're working on. Are you interested? Do you have time? 
and we would like to give you a commission to do this. And I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, for the dedication. But then afterwards, I heard that they were going to like email it all over the world and people would play it all over. So that's a big honor. That's really fantastic. So when we work together, um, I, when I get a commission, I'd like to have as much information as I can to get ideas and to get inspired. And so I asked the Carolineur in Belgium, like, do you know what was played on the instrument back five, you know, four or five hundred years ago? And he said, yes, we have all of that in the archives and they were Gregorian hymns. We talked back and forth and we decided to um, write a work, um, the Sacred Suite, which consists of three, three uh, movements. And they're all, all three of them are based on Gregorian chant. Uh, so the first is a peace hymn, uh, Da Pacem Domine, or in English, Give Peace, O Lord. The second movement is like a meditation. It's uh, Re Regina Celi, which means Queen of Heaven, rejoice. And the last one is very, um, is a bright, is a very happy um, hymn tune, uh, May the Grace of the Holy Ghost be with us now. And so, you know, you have three different characters. The last one is very happy and, and you know, uh, looking to the future uh, and bright and with a lot of belief and good hope. The middle one is like a meditation again and the first one kind of introduces the listener to the Gregorian chant that is used in the composition. There are about 600 instruments worldwide, not two are the same. So you have to think about carillons that are this size Carolines are bigger than mine. Um, Carolines Carolin that are made in the 16th century and in the 21st century. So you have to come up with a piece that can be played on all those different instruments. That was a challenge. That was not easy. Um, it's like, you know, you're writing something for violin, but they also give you a violin with one string instead of four or five. You know, like, oh my God, now I can't play it. No, you, so as, as a composer, you have to think on all these different things. That was a challenge, but I, it, so far so good, it worked. So um, the first movement is the hymn tune, Give Peace, O Lord, and it's really all about this very um, moving Gregorian chant, melody, very fluid, no accents, it's like, you know, um, yeah, very, yeah, f fluid actually. And so on. So it's really very, yeah, very round. It's singing beautifully. Um, and the second one um, is like a meditation. It's it's singing of the Regina Celi, so the Queen of Heaven. Um, and the melody is in the pedal here. And so on. So it's very, very different in, uh, in style and concept and character. And the last one is very bright, is very happy, is um, faster also, and uses more of the little notes. So, yeah, it's um, total, total, I think uh, in about six, seven minutes is, is the total length. And it's a, it's a very, yeah, happy, happy piece. I think that's what it should be too for a piece, Carolyn, right? 
It was, it was one of the most original commissions I ever got. Uh, you don't get commissions often that are going to be like played all over the world at the same day. So it was really something special. Um, also, this piece, um, especially written for a peace carillon with all the history behind the monastery, you know, and, and two cities working together and believing in the future and, and Veterans Day, I mean, everything together, it made it so, so special. Um, so I feel extremely honored. Um, and I'm very glad with the result. I worked several months in it. Uh, most of the summer, I was here in the tower composing and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad with the result. I hope that the other people are, will be too. Yeah. The piece for me is important. It's about believe, it's about a happy future. Um, and at this very moment, actually tomorrow, Friday, I have my oath ceremony. So Friday, um, tomorrow I'm going to be uh, a U.S. citizen. And I think it's important for, um, for people to um, believe in their future and work on it and work all together. You know, we're all in, in this together. And it's, it's so important that you have an open mind and be positive. And I think this piece is, that's what it's all about. Yeah. You can listen to Geert D. Hollander's live concerts from mid-October through mid-May, Thursdays to Sundays at 1 and 3 p.m. There's even an opportunity after each show to meet with Geert in person and ask him any questions you might have. For more information, visit www.bachtowergardens.org. If you're a fan of modern art, you might be interested in viewing one of Polk Museum of Art's latest exhibitions, Chagall Stories into Dreams. This show of Mark Chagall's work is the only one of its kind in Florida, presenting 42 works of art comprised of loans from a private collection in Italy. These works include Chagall's complete Story of Exodus color lithographic suite, as well as illustrations from his Fables of La Fontaine series of etchings. Check this out to learn more about the uniquely curated show, Chagall Stories into Dreams. Marc Chagall was arguably the most popular artist of the 20th century. He was different in many ways from most of the best known artists that we think of if we consider 20th century modern art. Many names pop into people's minds, Pablo Picasso, Henri Matisse, Jackson Pollock, Andy Warhol. But Marc Chagall is marked as the preeminent Jewish artist of the 20th century and he really popularized himself both by making enormous number of works. He was immensely prolific, but also because he reproduced a lot of his works into major series so people could collect them, he could make money off of them, and they became commercialized, which also then made him much better known throughout the century. He's also unusual in that he is a Belarusian artist. He was born in 1887, and his upbringing was so modest that you never would have expected he would have become so well known across the world. So he grew up in an Orthodox Hasidic Jewish family, and by the time he was 19 years old, he, as the eldest of nine children, he eventually went off to fine art school in St. Petersburg, Russia, before eventually in 1911 moving to Paris to see the latest and greatest in the modern art world. So he has this background that's very different from those that we think of coming from uh, mostly Western Europe or those that are already in Paris to begin with. He is coming from a different route and then he achieves this great acclaim. What I think a lot of viewers will gain when they come to a show like Chagall Stories into Dreams is they'll see familiar motifs that they'll recognize from their general familiarity with Chagall. Oftentimes people think about the fact that he has floating figures or floating animals, touches of nostalgia, things he's remembering from his past in Belarus and in Russia itself. But what we have in this show is several sets of series that deal with his illustrations of familiar parables and stories. So behind me here you see Chagall's illustrations from 1966 of the story of Exodus. And in 1966 he decided that it was important for him to focus on a story all about Jewish resilience and the search for Jewish identity, especially now years after World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust. 
He saw himself certainly as the most prominent Jewish artist in the world, probably still the most prominent Jewish artist ever, and he saw that it was important to explore a story that showed how the Israelites were freed from persecution and slavery in Egypt, then they sought their new promised land, they received um, redemption in God's eyes, and it was the way of developing a Jewish identity that people still think about today. But for him, in the years post-World War II, it felt like focusing on this series in 24-color lithographs would be a nice way to have a universal story that everyone knows, people are familiar with the Old Testament, but also spoke specifically to his own people. Um, in the 1920s, Chagall received a commission from an art dealer and gallerist by the name of Ambrose Vollard, and Vollard wanted Chagall to create illustrations for the fables of La Fontaine. Jean de La Fontaine created the fables, written as works that were based on Aesop fables. So people actually know Aesop's fables very well, and he created new French verse versions of them. Those were published in the late 17th century, and they became great treasures of the French literary world. And for Vollard in commissioning Chagall, he thought there were similarities between Chagall's interests in the world of animals or interactions of animals and figures and the idea of fables. Most of us know from fables, usually animals act in anthropomorphic ways. They're these stories that are endlessly relatable to everyone, and he thought that that was similar to Chagall. He was already receiving global acclaim. So in the 1920s, he's commissioned to do this Fables of La Fontaine suite. He does 100 etchings for the suite, all illustrations of these parables, each with their own moral. And we have in the show 15 of some of the best known ones, which I think are the greatest compositions he has in this series. So viewers of any of Chagall's fables will see stories that will be familiar to them, some stories that are kind of strange, stories whose morals they may or may not relate to, but they're wonderfully vivid, odd, uncanny illustrations. The concept underlying this show, and this is an original Polk Museum of Art exhibition, so the works in the show are on loan to us from a private collection in Pissarro, Italy, but we selected all of the works in the show to go along with the thesis of showing a different side of Chagall. Many people are familiar with just his whimsical, strange, fantastic paintings of scenes of everyday life, scenes sometimes of him in Paris, or nostalgic scenes of him back in his old life, back in the shtetl. But in our case, we want to show the idea of Chagall as the illustrator, taking these stories that most of us know, or stories that most of us have remembrances of, and approaching them from his own unique manner. So we thought that this pairing would be interesting. Um, we thought that it, the pairing would be interesting both because of the compositions themselves. The Fables of La Fontaine are black and white series of etchings, and the Fables uh, and the Story of Exodus behind me here, um, they are colored lithographic etchings. So you see a change in the style of Chagall, you see a change in the way that he is approaching his subject matter, and then in addition to the two series, we also have two original paintings in the exhibition, which explore the idea of his muses or his inspirations. Um, I reached out specifically to the art company in Pissarro, Italy, and this was one of three sets of shows that we brought in all together in one shipment. So a little bit of behind the scenes gossip about the show, you can learn a little bit about how we put this together. We've had these Chagall works here since last December, in fact. So if anybody has come to the museum in recent months or even in the past year, we had a Renoir show, another big name. We had a Goya and Picasso show, two other big names in art history, and the Chagall show. And all of those works came in in one shipment from Italy. So we've had them here and we've been rolling them out. But those works just came in as the actual pieces themselves, so ceramics and etchings and lithographs and paintings, and then we built our own shows around them, which made for a really nice deal for me as an art historian and for us as a museum to be able to put on unique exhibitions with our own information, our own text, our own audio guides, our own theses with great works of art from Europe is another really exciting twist. So um, it came out really well. Now we have a really nice relationship with the art company, and we'll work with them very much in the future. One of our major missions is to raise the academic caliber and the intellectual heft of the kinds of shows we produce here. And so a name like Chagall is familiar to most audiences. And while we hope that that will draw people in, we also hope that they will learn a lot through a show like this. And uh, I guarantee as you come here, you will see works you've never seen before by Chagall. And you're going to learn so much more about what his intention was throughout his really lengthy career. He lived to be 98 years old. So we have 
so much within this show to give you a sense of what he was working on in the 1920s and the 1960s, all the way to the 1970s with one of our paintings in the show. So I think people will learn a lot about him, learn a lot about the history of the time, um, and also re-familiarize themselves with maybe stories like the story of Exodus, which they don't remember all of the details of. And you see some really familiar moments from those stories that have played out in Hollywood and other literature and other illustrations. So it's a new way to look at Chagall, and for many people who maybe aren't even all that familiar with Chagall, to learn a lot about him, maybe for the first time. Chagall Stories into Dreams will be on display at the Polk Museum of Art until January 6, 2019. For more information, visit www.polkmuseumofart.org. Last month marked Lakeland's sixth annual Art Crawl, a free one-day art festival that celebrates the emergence of new artists in and around Central Florida. The Juried Art Festival featured 60 local artists from over 20 different cities, all of whom had the opportunity to sell their artwork and compete for prizes alongside live music, performances, and art demonstrations. Check this out to learn more about Art Crawl and meet some of the artists from this year's event. So Art Crawl is a, an outdoor festival. It was organized through the Polk Museum of Art, started there, but then has now graduated on into its own uh, 501c3. So it's been run that way for the past two years. Um, it's an art festival that we um, have created so that we can exhibit emerging and new um, artists here locally, and locally meaning Central Florida. Um, we also have performers, that's dance, that's theater. Um, we also have music, live entertainment. And then we also have hands-on art activities. Um, I'm a big advocate of trying to get that hands-on um, interaction with the, uh, with the community, and that's part of that. So the criteria in order to get into Art Crawl is um, we do invite professional artists to be on board with the Art Crawl itself um, to serve sort of like mentors to those that may have never exhibited before. And that's just kind of the rub elbows next door to each other um, and support. But one of the main things to um, qualify for uh, Art Crawl is the fact that you're a local artist, um, you're emerging or new, and this can be in the idea that you, you just started, maybe you were tired and you just started art, you know, or started creating, and maybe you had a career before or something of that sort that you used to do back in the day and then you know, life could, got a hold of you and then you start again. Um, and so those that are wanting to venture into the art world, is, this is a platform for them. Those that have just graduated college and have a full portfolio of artwork that they've created, and it's here. We, we want to deliver that to our community. So artists don't only have to, um, they don't only compete in order to get into the festival, but they also compete at the festival. These awards range from first to third, and then we also have a People's Choice Award where participants will choose their own. And then we also have a, a Sponsor Purchase Award, which is where we encourage a local business to start their own collection and choose an artist to purchase from. So I think it's very important for people to, our community, to support artists in general, to be accepted and acknowledged for what they do um, is, is, is huge. And on top of that, art education in general, you know, we had probably about eight art teachers in, the, um, in this year's festival. You know, it's one of those things that we always want to give a platform for furthering their career, for their love. Um, supporting them in any facet as we can. It's a beautification idea as well for those that may be looking for an artist. Here it is. Here's your opportunity to meet somebody. Um, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do is get those artists up and out of um, our community and, and show and shine a light on them. How are you? I've been doodling pretty much my whole life, um, but I didn't actually start painting uh, until about two years ago. I decided to, uh, to learn how to draw faces because I couldn't. It was just a bad day when I tried. Um, so I sat down and I practiced. I started with more celebrity portraits because everybody can tell if you mess up a celebrity. Um, and then I just sort of went from there. Now I just do my own thing and, and my own creations. I tend to 
go more towards darker, more surrealistic things. Um, I like making people question what they think is societally acceptable as beautiful. So I like combining things that people consider beautiful with more bizarre items. So either skulls with butterflies or they see a pretty girl but she has bugs on her or she's wearing a skull mask or, or the combination of darker and light that, that really speaks to me and, and makes people look at things twice when they walk past it. A lot of people, they love buying original art. They want to have something to say, hey, I got this really cool piece from an artist. But most people don't necessarily want to spend hundreds of dollars on a piece of artwork, which is understandable, or they don't have the space for a large piece of art. So I do little wood pieces. Is like combining my little art with nature and they're really good desk decorations or just something fun for people to decorate their house with or have in a, in a smaller space. Um, I do love art, but I think it's an amazing opportunity for emerging artists to come and get their art seen. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for the community to come and see different art, a lot of artists. Um, I also think that it's a great way for being able to see things that you usually wouldn't get the opportunity to see. Um, like myself, I'm just a hobby artist. I don't do shows all around the state. So this is something that's sort of a treat for, for myself. Um, and I, I, I definitely plan on continually coming back, or if I'm not actively in the show, I'll definitely be supporting it. So I live in Palm Harbor right now, which is Tampa Bay area. Um, but the first time I heard about Art Crawl was when I was in Orlando. I was doing um, Art Lando show there and Ellen came up to me, approached me and said that she thought Art Crawl would be something I would do well at. So she invited me and I've been coming ever since. So um, I have a neurological condition called synesthesia, which is fairly rare. Not a lot of people have it. Um, but what happens is uh, there's some sort of merging in the brain between the auditory and the visual senses. So whenever I hear sound, it results in me seeing colors and shapes and movement. Um, it's not something that I, I see in my field of vision, but it's in my mind's eye. And so almost everything that I paint represents what I see when I hear a piece of music. Um, so for example, like I have pieces by Radiohead and Alt-J and um, some classical music. My degree is actually in classical music, so I was a musician before I became an artist. When I hear a song that visually is stunning to me, that's worth painting, I will um, you know, lay out the colors that I see and, and the canvas on, in the studio and either put on my headphones or the speaker and just loop the song while I paint so it's matching up with what I'm seeing, what's on the canvas and what the song looks like to me. Arts are so important um, to give a voice to that sort of part of humanity that's inexpressible. You know, a lot of times people who are going through hard times, um, grief and loss and shame and pain and things, you know, uh, we don't really have the words to express that kind of stuff. And personally, when I was going through a hard time, art was the only thing that really helped me express emotions I didn't know how to say with words. And a lot of people who come and see my art, they can see that, they can feel that. And that's, that's why I like doing art, because I can connect with people who have been through difficult things. And so back to your question, like why is art important? I think it allows people to connect in ways that they couldn't otherwise. And it gives a voice to um, hope and strengthening communities. For more information on Art Crawl, visit www.artcrawlfl.com. And if you missed the festival this year, you can always look forward to it next November. Well, that's all I have for this month, but there's always plenty going on within the Pope County art scene. Stay tuned for a list of art events in your area. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next month for more art out and about.